Thank you for joining us for the launch of our Contemporary Translated Works Book Group. The Contemporary Translated Works Book Group explores languages, cultures, and the arts of translation through contemporary literature. I'm Nico Chen, and I am the program manager here at Mechanics Institute. I'm Leslie Ann Wefter. I'm the Public Programs Director at the Center for the Art of Translation. This book group is co-presented with the Center for the Art of Translation. Beijing Sprawl, our May selection, celebrates Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Leslie, can you also give us a quick overview for the Center of the Art of Translation? If you're not already familiar with our work, the Center for the Art of Translation is a San Francisco-based nonprofit organization founded in 2000 that champions literary translation. Our publications, events, and educational programming enrich the library of vital literary works, nurture and promote the work of translators, build audiences for literature and translation, connect with local communities, and honor the incredible linguistic and cultural diversity of our schools and our world. You can find out more about our publications and upcoming events at catranslation.org. Thank you, Leslie. And Mechanics Institute was founded in 1854 and is one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature a full service general interest library, an internationally renowned chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and the Cinema Lit film series. We also host a number of book groups, such as our bi-weekly world literature book group and our monthly brown bag mystery readers group. We are excited to extend this work with the Center for the Art of Translation and to extend this work to a national and global guests and audiences. This literary journey begins with Beijing Sprawl by Tzu Tzu-Chin, a narrative that invites you to explore the vibrant heart of contemporary Chinese fiction. In case you haven't gotten your copy of Beijing Sprawl yet, we're providing coupon codes for you in our chat box for you to use. On Wednesday, June 5th, from noon to 1.15 Pacific time, readers who want to discuss this book will also have the option to regather for our book group discussion, either online on Zoom at the same link as today, or on site in our beautiful fourth floor uh, boardroom at Mechanics Institute. Together, we will delve deeper into Beijing sprawl, continue this literary adventure with us, discovering the stories that connect us across cultures and languages through translation. We are also planning our next book group selection to be a Spanish to English translation, celebrating Latinx Heritage Month. So please keep your eyes peeled for our next book selection in the fall. Today's introductory discussion with Jeremy Chang will include a Q&A with the audience. Please add your questions as they emerge into the chat and Nico and I will read them aloud during the latter half of today's event. Nico will now introduce you to our special guest. The wonderful Jeremy Tiang, uh, they go by he and they pronouns, is a novelist, playwright, and Sinophone translator. Recent translations include Liu Xin Wu's The Wedding Party, which was shortlisted for the National Translation Award, as well as novels by Zhang Yueran, Shuang Shui Tao, Lou Yi Chen, Yan Ge, and Yang Pui Nong. Their novel, State of Emergency, won the Singapore Literature Prize in 2018. They were the Princeton University Translator in Residence in 2022 and served on the jury of the International Booker Prize and the National Book Award. Originally from Singapore, they live in Flushing, Queens. In hey. addition to this impressive resume, Jeremy also delivered the keynote address at the 2022 Day of Translation a day-long symposium of panels on language and literature organized by the Center for the Art of Translation in Washington, DC. Jeremy's keynote, titled Why We Translate What We Translate, is an excellent crash course in understanding the larger issues currently present in the field of literary translation. We'll link to a video of Jeremy's keynote in the chat in case you're inspired to dive a little deeper after our conversation today. And now we will get started with our initial conversation with the wonderful translator, Jeremy Tiang. Jeremy Tiang, um, it's great to have you. And the first question that we wanna start off with is this. Um, let's start with your linguistic autobiography. How might people understand who you are through the, through the lens of language? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, Nico. And thanks to the Mechanics Institute and the Center for the Art of Translation for organizing this event. Um, I, I think I'm very much um, defined by language in that I grew up in a multilingual country, Singapore, a place with four official languages where um, your community is often defined by the language or languages that you speak. Um, 
the, the official languages of Singapore are English, Mandarin, Malay, and Tamil. I speak the first two, English and Mandarin. Um, my parents spoke English to us and Cantonese to each other sometimes, a language they refused to teach us because only Mandarin counted as proper Chinese. My dad also speaks Tamil, um, which he somehow never passed on. Um, I went to an English primary school and a Chinese secondary school. So I've kind of always moved between languages. Um, and so I, I write primarily in English, a little in Chinese. Um, and I see my translation as part of my writing practice. Um, it makes sense for me to move between languages um, because that's kind of what I've done my whole life. And in a way, translation is the only thing that allows me to pull together all the different bits of my linguistic self, um, rather than having to just stay in one lane, as it were. Thank you for that, Jeremy. Let's dive into Beijing Sprawl. Could you tell us a little bit more about the book and about the author and what drew you to this work? Um, how did you encounter it? Um, so about half the books that I translate um, are books that I find and bring to publishers, and the other half are books that come to me in other ways. Um, this was a little bit in between in that it was brought to me by another translator, Eric Abramson, um, who had a long-standing relationship with Sri Zertsen, um, and had in fact translated his first book, Running Through Beijing, not his first book, but his first book in English, Running Through Beijing for Two Lines Press. Um, Eric initially said, would, you, would I like to translate one of Sri Zertsen's short stories for um, a journal he was editing at the time, Pathlight. Um, he later drew me into co-editing that, but that's a whole separate story. So I translated one short story for this journal, and then I did another one. Um, and then at a certain point, Eric said, oh, I'm pitching this short story collection to Two Lines Press. Can, I, can we use your short story translation? And then I'll do the rest of it. Um, and then he kind of said, oh, actually, could you do a couple more? And I somehow slipped into co-translating the book um, without completely, um, it, it was, I don't know if that's a positive version of being the frog in the boiling water, but that's kind of how it happened. I somehow ended up co-translating this book before I quite realized what was happening, but in a good way, because it's a lovely book. Um, Sri Zertsen is quite an unusual writer in that he's a very Beijing writer, but he isn't from Beijing, he's a transplant, and he writes about his fellow transplants. He came to um, Beijing as a university student, and he lived amongst um, what are known as Bei Piao, the migrant workers who come to Beijing um, to do often under the table work, um, often have no official status in the city and have trouble accessing education or health care. Um, and so he started writing their stories, um, which is what Beijing Sprawl is about. It's the stories of people who keep the city of Beijing functioning, who do all the menial and dirty work that um, you know is often not seen because it takes place in the dead of night or it's just something that most people don't want to 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 detect to notice um he tells the stories of these people um and kind of creates a a, a world where you have to pay attention to the beijingers who who i guess are doing the real work of keeping the city running Thank you. I think it'd be great if you could read a little bit from Beijing Sprawl to give us the kind of idea of, of the narrator we find in this collection and, and kind of the overall tone of the stories. Yes. So the narrator of all the stories is Mu Yu, a high school dropout who has come to Beijing to work for his uncle, um, advertising his, basically his fake document um, company. Um, all of this is extremely illegal, but I, that's the case with most of the characters we encounter. Um, so I'll just read the section where uh, Mu Yu is describing his work. So now here I was, living with Xing Jian, Mi Luo, and Bao Lai in this ping fang, paying 240 a month rent. 
We slept in two bunk beds in the same room and all four of us did the same work, going out at night and putting up small ads. You took a Sharpie, found an empty bit of wall somewhere eye-catching and wrote, seals and documents, please contact 510-939-1493. Xing Jian and Milo worked for Cheng Xing Duo, while Ba Lai and I worked for my uncle. Sometimes we didn't use a pen or paste up ads, but dabbed a carved yam onto an ink-soaked sponge as a stamp, much faster than writing. I was in charge of carving the words into the root vegetable. You wouldn't call it pretty, but it was legible at a glance. We worked only at night to avoid getting arrested. The squinty, watchful eyes of security guards and police officers were everywhere, and they'd nab whoever they could. They'd all be asleep by the small hours, though, even in the wealthy district of Zhongguanchun. The two of us boldly wrote and stamped our message on walls, bus stops, overhead bridges, stairs, even on the street itself. Sanitation workers would wash away our words and we'd rewrite them, let wildfires burn them down, spring breezes would raise them again. People who wanted seals carved or documents sorted out would obediently follow the trail of breadcrumbs to 30 Thao Hong and he'd pass the job on to his forgers. I wasn't sure how much he actually earned doing this, but he paid us 500 a month. Balai said, this isn't bad, bro. We go out after midnight and make our rounds, like taking a nighttime stroll. And we get paid for it. He was content, and I was too. Not because of the money, but because I liked the night. It was quiet in the early hours when Beijing's dust had settled. The roads were like dry riverbeds, and the city felt much larger. Nighttime Beijing seemed more spacious, a vast and empty landscape beneath gentle streetlights, Ever since my nerves weakened, my dreams had grown to be as jostling and fragmented as daytime Beijing. If I could have dreamed such a scene of capacious peace as the night, I'd probably have woken out of sheer joy. We slept from dawn till the afternoon. To make sure I was tired enough, I forced myself to jump around in my spare time, and I jogged every chance I got. If you happened to be wandering around Beijing back then, in the small hours of the night, you might have seen a tall, skinny teenager with spiky hair hyperactively haunting the streets and alleyways of the capital. Yep, that was me. I have to unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you so much for that beautiful reading, Jeremy. And um, for those of us who might want to read along to that passage, uh, where would we find that passage? Um, it is part of the story on the rooftop, which is... Um... Page 107. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, and that's like um, a couple of pages into the story. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to our next question. Um, so a reoccurring theme through all of these stories in Beijing Sprawl is, of course, Beijing. <laughs> the city is arguably the main character of this interwoven collection of vignettes. Have you had firsthand experience in this place? And how did this project or other experiences help you better understand the complex cultural context that is Beijing? Um yeah, I, I think a lot of translation is a virtuous circle, um, in a way answering Kara's question in the chat. Um, I, I think you need some level of being bicultural um, in order to translate, and that includes knowing the place you're translating about. Um, so when I first started translating work from China, I realized that I needed to spend some time there. I've never been able to live live in China, but I used to go there for up to a month at a time. Um, and I still visit as often as I can. Um, until the pandemic um, put a bit of a break in that, I used to go at least once a year, and I've resumed that again. Um, I, I just went um, last month for the first time since the pandemic, and I hope to resume my trips, because I do think I want to stay in touch with these places that I'm translating about. Beijing very much has its own character. Um, it changes very fast. So every time I go back, something has shifted that I need to reacquaint myself with. 
Um, and I feel like I have now spent enough time there that I do have a sense of not just the geography of the capital, but also it, its character, its people. I wouldn't say as well as someone who has lived there, which Eric has. Um, so I did also lean on my co-translator um, for his local knowledge. But I think enough that I have a sense of the atmosphere and also that I know enough people that if I need to ask questions about a specific aspect of Beijing, there are people I can go to to say, how does this work or what is that like? Um, and when all else fails, because I was translating this at a point in the pandemic where travel into China was impossible, there is always Google Maps. That's funny. <laughs> I can't imagine being in Beijing and just using Google Maps to get around. I don't know <laughs> if that would work for me. <laughs> I I also have a question about kind of what other kinds of contemporary literature is being published in Beijing um, at the time that Beijing Sprawl was published, um, and what was the reception of of the work of Sui Chichen in China, and if it's different than it has been in the U.S. Um. Well, this, this is a relatively recent collection, but it harkens back to his younger days. And I think he's been writing these stories for a while. They were published separately um, over the years before being collected um, just a few years ago. Um, so, so the main difference in reception is that Xu Zhexian is very famous in China um, in a way that he's really still just being introduced in the US. Um, and I think that leads to the work being read differently. Um, like, I, I think um, in China, people are maybe more aware of the gap between Sri Jurchen, famous writer, and the world he's depicting. Whereas um, I think in the US, people might not be aware that um, he's not necessarily describing his own life. He's describing the life of the people around him, um, of the community he was part of. Um, but he was a graduate student, so it wasn't quite the same for him. Um, but also... I think that just isn't the same sense of place. Like many readers in China will have been to Beijing or will have at least some awareness of it. Um, so there's a kind of immediacy to the, the place that's being written about. Um, it's not, you know, say one of the small villages that Mo Yen writes about where you, maybe a lot of readers are also learning about it. Um, it, it's got Beijing kind of has the same weight as say New York does to a US reader, where even if you aren't from there or haven't been, you know it from a million TV shows and movies. Beijing kind of has that resonance, which I don't think it quite has for US readers. Um, so both in terms of familiarity with the author and familiarity with the place, um, there's this gap that means readers come to this book quite differently in both places. Thank you for that, Jeremy. And something that came up for me as I was reading the book is um, sort of like the grand narratives of different countries. You know, in the United States, we have um, this idea of the American dream. And I think in Beijing Sprawl, there's also this idea of like a Chinese dream or a Beijing dream. How does this Chinese or Beijing dream kind of relate to the American dream? How are they similar, but also yet different? I feel like in America, the narrative is anyone can be anything, right? No matter um, who you are, you could aspire to be the president, etc. Uh, whereas in China, um, because of the Hukou registration system, um, people often have a ceiling on their ambition. None of the characters in, these book, in this book are ever going to get very far because they're from outside the city. Without a city registration, they will never have official status in Beijing. Um, they'll never be able to buy property or get, um, you know, a, a more respectable job or um, really get ahead. Like their, their aim is more modest. It's, it's to just make a better living than they could back home or to make a living at all. Um, so I think that is still a dream in the sense of they will have better lives than their ancestors, than their parents, and they will hopefully bring some of this back home. 
Um, but it isn't quite that American thing of the sky is the limit. Um, I, I think that's a more realistic sense of based on where and when I was born, I will only advance this far. Um, and I think you get a sense of that in, in, the, in the novel. Short story collection. I kind of think of it as a novel because it um, it involves the same characters all the way through. But um, I, I think the division is a bit more porous in, in China. I'm rambling now. Um, where was I? Oh, yes, dreams. Um, th these characters do have dreams, but I think they are maybe more realistic. Thank you for that. I would I would like to take a little bit of time, a little bit of the time we have left and talk about the art of translation, of course. Um, it is in the name. Um, you and Nico and I had a brief conversation before the event started about how you became a literary translation translator um, and what kind of inspired your global literature journey. I'd like for you to share that with the whole group, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I, I think if you are a writer um, with more than one language, it can be a very natural transition. Um, and because Singapore is becoming increasingly English dominated, um, as someone who is bilingual, I found I was always pressing Singaporean books written in Chinese on my Chinese speaking friends who would say, oh, my Chinese isn't good enough to read this. Um, and it felt like the only way I could get these books appreciated um, was to translate them into English. So I started doing that. Um, and there were other encounters that made me want to translate, um, just to, to connect the different language communities in Singapore, but also just to make personal connections. One of my high school teachers was a playwright. And as a teenager, I watched his plays um, and he wrote in Chinese. And at a certain point when I started writing plays myself, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could translate one of these into English and get it staged in Singapore? And I did that. Um, and it, it felt like giving a whole new life to a text and engaging with it at a deeper level than previously just watching it. Um, I did a writing residency where the, the Chinese author Zhang Yuran also happened to be. Um, and because writers will use any procrastination tactic available to them, I somehow ended up translating um, some of her short stories instead of writing my own. And that became um, one of my longer standing collaborations. In fact, I'm currently working on um, a fo the fourth book of hers that I'm bringing into English. Um, so it's it's been a mixture of personal connections, of moving between the language communities of Singapore, of just wanting to share work that I'm enthusiastic about that has led me into the realm of translation. Thank you for sharing that, Jeremy. And I want to um, quickly talk about the title, um, Beijing Sprawl. And so um, when I read the title in its original Chinese, um, I translate it directly as um, a short story collection from Beijing's West District. And so I was wondering, how did you and your co-translator happen upon Beijing Sprawl as the title for this translation? Well, first of all, we ruled out a direct translation because um, it doesn't exactly trip off the tongue. And frankly, I don't even think it's a good title in Chinese. I, I don't think anyone is particularly enticed by a short story collection from Beijing's Western District. Um, and I feel like you can get away with that in China because Sri Dirtin is very, very famous. But um, in, in the US, we needed something maybe a bit catchier. Um, my co-translator, Eric, um, immediately suggested West Side Stories, um, which both I and CJ, the editor, immediately vetoed. Um, and then I actually pulled up the email um, where we came up with our suggestions. So for a while, we were going with Beijing Marginalia, Beijing Margins, Beijing on the Edge, um, and on the rooftop, which is one of the titles of the short stories in the collection. And then we got to Beijing rooftops. Then we started focusing more on the people. So we had Beijing slackers. Um, but eventually um, we settled on Beijing sprawl because so much of the book is about how the city is spreading out um, 
And indeed, um, the they talk a lot about being on the edge of the city um, because they were on what is now the fourth ring road of the city. Um, but that is very much no longer the edge of Beijing. We're now into the fifth ring road. Um, so in a way, the, the city has sprawled past these people. Um, it's kind of endlessly rolling out into the countryside around it and devouring it. So that seems to encapsulate both the sense of the city itself and the sea expanding. But also the word sprawl has resonances with the concept of Tangping or lying flat, which is something that has recently arisen in China. The idea that wow. maybe instead of striving, you should just take a break. Um, this is a bit anachronistic because it didn't exist at the time that the book is set, but it felt resonant. Um, to answer Ilsa's question, the author doesn't speak English, so we tried discussing some of the titles with him, but there's only so much you can do in terms of back translating our titles into Chinese and trying to explain the resonances. And at a certain point, he just said, I'll trust you. Um, I'll go with whatever you decide. I'll ask one final question and then we'll we'll transition into our Q&A portion of the event. Um, Jeremy, are there any authors or books in translation? It can be from Chinese, it can be from any language um, that you would like to recommend or share with this group as we start down this, this path on translated works? Yeah, there are a couple I'd like to recommend. Um, the first is translated from Chinese. It's The Age of Goodbyes by Li Zixu, um, translated by Wai Zi Qin. Um, it's a fantastic book um, by a Malaysian Chinese author. It's a fractured narrative dealing with troubled histories from Malaysia. Um, it's got doubling multiple perspectives. You're never quite sure where you are in time. Um, it's just one of the most surreal and adventuresome novels that I've ever encountered. It's a lot of fun and it kind of, are you going to produce it? Oh, amazing. Um, it, it's just um, one of the weirdest books I've ever encountered, um, which for me is definitely a must read. Um, and my other book is a two lines book, um, On a Woman's Madness by Astrid Roma, translated by Lucy Scott. Um, that's a book from Suriname, um, my first ever book that I read from Suriname, um, that is just, again, extremely weird. I never quite knew where I was in the story of a woman um, finding her way to self-determination after a, an abusive marriage. Um, thank you. And and I'm. it's been particularly in my mind because um, Astrid Roma's next book in English, um, Off-White, um, is being published soon. And I am so eager to get hold of that and to read it. Thank you for sharing that, Jeremy. And um, I'm going to ask um, a question from Walt, uh, Walker Griggs. Um, he says that my only experience with translating was with a researcher translating old Sikh, uh, Sikh and Hindu texts. She took a feminist approach and made sure to keep gender neutral pronouns were appropriate, but this wasn't always a popular decision, but it was to the core of her identity. So that leads into the question, were there any decisions you made in translation that were based off of your morals or convictions or personality? I, I think the way I would put this is that I choose to translate texts that are consistent with my morals, convictions, and personality. And so all the decisions that I made are rooted in the text. Like ultimately as a translator, um, I'm serving the text. I'm also bringing my own interpretation to my translation, but I'm not going to impose anything. So if I ever felt that my convictions were at odds with the convictions of the text, then that would, that's probably a sign that I'm not the right translator for it. Um, so yes, my, my decisions are informed um, by my the ethical framework that I bring to my writing. Um, but I, I don't say that in a way of I'm shaping um, the text in a particular way. Rather, I'm finding the resonances between the text and myself, and that's the interpretation that I present.
see, we have another question here from Kay. How do you tra handle translating concepts or phrases that have no direct equivalent in the language and culture you are translating to? Um, so sometimes I just leave them and try to insert contextual clues that will explain these concepts. And, and quite often that is necessary. Um, there, are, there are things like um, just simple food things where if possible, I try to, you know, have the word xiaozi and yuntun because these are not just contained in the word dumpling. And then I try to insert enough explanations that the reader is able to picture what these things are. Um, if possible, I try to find a character. I, I hope that there is a character there who might not know what this concept is. Um, so if it's... if this is part of a recollection, say, I have been able to insert a, oh, you remember, and then a little one-line explanation. Um, if all else fails, I'll put something in parentheses. I try to avoid footnotes because I feel like that pulls the reader out of the text and can make it feel a bit academic. When people often are coming to a translation work with a sociological mindset you know that there are certain readers who come to a work and go well what can I learn about China and adding footnotes kind of feels like you're feeding that um, this desire to see the book as educational so I try to um, insert any necessary explanations as seamlessly as possible into the text itself um, and if all else fails I just make sure to use the most common term for that thing so people can google it Go back to Google again. It's kind of always the answer here. Um, could I ask you to talk a little bit more about your hesitancy to make a work educational? I think that's interesting. Um, so uh, Chen Si An, um, an, a playwright whose work I translate, had a play reading in London. Um, and the theater company was like, oh, well, obviously we're going to have an all Asian cast. This is a work from China. Um, and Si An was actually quite upset by that she said I've written a play about homelessness and through this casting you've made it a play about homelessness in China you've let the British audience off the hook they don't have to think about their own society um, and I think that is the danger of seeing the work as educational you kind of treat it as being about the other you're learning about a different place and there's no need to then reflect on yourself or your own society um, and I, I encourage instead identification um, and empathy, and maybe finding the resonances and the connections rather than the the learning points, which implicitly um, suggest that the work is away from you. I, I I prefer to bring the reader to the work. And I have a question from Michelle Anderson. Are there any authors who are famous in China but still remain unknown in the United States because of a lack of translation into English? So many. Um, <laughs> yes, and anyone particularly who is younger, um, because there was this big wave of translation where authors like Mo Yan and Su Tong um, and Yan Lianke did somewhat come to the public awareness in the US. But a lot of writers under the age of 40 just haven't had the same amount of translation. Um, and that's something that I, you know, try to push, um, try to bring attention to authors who are less well known. Um, but actually, in the Chinese speaking world, um, the situation is even more acute outside of mainland China. And there are way more famous authors in Taiwan and Hong Kong and Singapore and Malaysia who haven't been translated. Um, and I also focus on them in my work, particularly as a, a Chinese speaker from outside mainland China. Um, so yes, there is, you know, in most Western European countries, um, the, the well-known authors are very picked over, right? Um, there are book scouts and agents working overtime to make sure anyone with prominence is translated. Um, and that's very much not the case in um, the Chinese speaking world, or indeed most of Asia outside of perhaps Japan. Um, say hi to my cat, everyone. What is what is their name, Jeremy? Uh, my cat is called Maddie. 
<laughs> Hello, Maddie. It's lovely to see another living being in your space there. Um, I have a question also from Howie Zhang. Um, they are a student poet um, in the Gadical country after Wu Yang Yu, who you can find distributing and circulating poetic exchange um, at the WeChat at Otherland. But their question is, why lead bilingual readers and writers to spend more time in the Anglophone world rather than the Sinosphere? or in other linguistic worlds that seem to be diminishing uh, as across the globe, language teaching seems to be less and less supported and more functional um, commerce oriented. Should we not resist minor Chinese readers limited confidence and aspirations and encourage more other um, language immersion and education instead? I think that's a really good question and I do encourage it. It's just my own experience is spending years and years pressing Chinese language books on friends and just having facing resistance from them. Um, so I have sometimes been able to persuade people to just try a text in the Chinese or like find them a simpler text that they might be able to attempt. Um, but I have found that having a translation available can be confidence building. And I do know people who have then gone out and tried to read the original alongside my translation. So using the translation as a kind of support. Um, yeah, I, I would I would dearly love for everyone with some Chinese to increase their language skills by reading in the original or even by attempting translation themselves, because um, frankly, translation is one of the greatest means of language acquisition that there is. Um, but I'm also realistic about not everyone being prepared to do that. Um, but yeah, when I am at doing book events in Singapore, I will slip in a, you could also read the original, it is available for sale. Um, so I, I do try to, yeah, hedge, um, navigate that difference, um, whilst also being aware that that isn't always going to happen. And them reading the book is in English is better than not reading it at all. And um, how did you begin your foray into literary translation? Are there any authors or translators or personal relations that inspired your interest in global literature? Um, I mean, the thing is, I don't think of it as global literature. Like, I'm, I'm from Singapore. I'm from the periphery. I'm, you know, I, I think the idea of global literature is, is something that... Um, maybe you only have the luxury of thinking of when you're at the center. Um, I, I kind of grew up in Singapore, pre-internet, reading British and American books and having no idea what half the things they were talking about referred to. Like I was just very confused reading Faulkner and I just plowed through it. Um, so I, I think I, always been into global literature in that if I was reading anything from outside Singapore, which let's face it, is 99% of the world, we are a very small country. Um, I've, I've just always been international, internationally minded in that sense. Um, so yeah, for, for me, it was just a very natural movement. Um, because everything I read was from outside of Singapore. Like the, the Singapore publishing scene has since grown a lot livelier. But when I was growing up, you could read every book that was published in Singapore in that year and still have a lot of space left on your reading list. Um, so yeah, I, I think now that I'm in the US, um, I find that my relationship to so-called global literature is extremely different to most US-based translators and writers and readers. This is a final question here. Um, what excites you about translation, whether it's translation as a concept or a translation community or translation as a practice or something else completely different? Um, I, I think what excites me about um, translation is the conversations going on at the moment. Um, and this kind of links to Papa Runa's final question in the chat about um, essentially how we can decolonize translation. Um, I think there is this sense of translation in, um, in the past 
of just being something that we take, like we go into a place, we take a text, we bring it into a different place, and we don't really think about its connection or, or the culture and community it comes from. And just having an awareness of this in our reading, um, of the way we talk about translation, of, of you know, not thinking of it as educational, not um, treating it as something that we are bestowing on the source culture or source language, um, of not assuming that authors are always going to be delighted to be translated into English, um, of not treating translation into English as some kind of prize. Um, I think just in the framing of it, in the way we relate to the literature and the way it is carried out, um, there's a lot more awareness now. And I think um, publishers such as Two Lines are stepping up and trying to ensure that um, practices are more equitable and that the relationship isn't as unequal as it has been in the past. Um, and I'm particularly glad that there are more heritage language bicultural um, translators. I feel like that is now more of a space in the US translation community for people from backgrounds that such as I come from um, than there has been in the past. So it, it does feel like there is a shift towards not just translation in the sense of moving from one language to another, but translation in the sense of being part of a global community and being aware of inequalities within this community and how we can minimize them. Thank you for that, Jeremy. And I just want to give you just a minute to just talk about anything you want to talk about. It could be things that upcoming projects that you are working on or a final message to end this um, conversation today? Um, well, I want to answer Paparuna's final question. How should those of us who don't read Chinese read Chinese literature in translation? Um, that's a really great question. Um, and I, I, I think the answer is not thoughtlessly, but also not fearfully. Um, I, I think you know, there, there has been extractivism and a certain colonial mindset in the past. I have had editors turn down my translation because they don't feel Chinese enough, because um, they're not set in the countryside like Moyen's books or whatever. Um, but I, I think the flip side is also there can be a fearfulness about doing the wrong thing or approaching it wrong or not being empathetic enough. And I, I think if you're already asking these questions, then you are reading it in the right way. Like, I, I don't think that being fearful of um, of getting it wrong because of historical mistakes should get in the way of an enjoyment of a text. Um, so I would say have an awareness of the context and the, you know, the, the past inequalities that has um, beset the translation world, but also just have, enter the space with, with with openness and and see what you receive. Thank you so much for Jer Thank you so much, Jeremy. That is a wonderful sentiment to end our meeting on. Um, thank you to Nico and the Mechanics Institute, and thank you to all of you who are here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks for this great conversation and for everyone's great questions. And I do also want, want to welcome everyone to our follow-up book discussion that's happening on Wednesday, June 5th, either in person at Mechanics Institute or online at the same Zoom link from 12 to 1.15 p.m. Um, I also welcome all of you, if you can, to open up your video or your audio and just, you know, bid goodbye to our wonderful translator. We are honored that you are here, Jeremy. We just want to make sure that we also connect in this uh, in this virtual space here.